Chrono Cross is an underrated gem. However, many feel that the cast, which consists of 45 playable characters, is too bloated. But to me, that's nothing more than an invitation for self-inflicted suffering. So I challenged myself to be Chrono Cross with only the yellow characters. But that's not my only challenge. I also aim to be Chrono Cross with only yellow elements. And just to be explicit about the rules, only yellow characters can be used in battle, and if none are available, I can only use the lowest strength normal attack and cast yellow elements. And to prevent excessive meat shielding, all other characters must remain clothed in their starting equipment. The only command they may use is the defend command. And of course, the only elements that may be used, attack, offensive, and healing, are yellow elements. With the caveat that this is not the primary challenge, and I'll be counting up the battles in which yellow elements are necessary. There's a detailed set of rules in the discreetly do, so head there if you're confused. Let's jump right in. I named the protagonist Mellow Yellow. We start out in a Fort Dragonia dream sequence with no yellow characters. And while I could simply reset until a yellow character appears in the party, there are no mandatory battles in this section. So I run to the end, poke a hole in Kid to help carbonate her, and we wake up in our childhood bedroom. And my first task is to get my first yellow character of the run. So I pilfer a Hecran bone from my neighbor's bedroom, as one does, and I offer it up to the adorable doggo Poshel. And while she looks pink, she's actually yellow. This gift entices her to join our team, and we name her Hamachi. I hadn't figured out the theme yet, and so I thought I was just gonna do yellow food, so this name sucks. Sorry, Doggofish. Anyway, now that I have my first yellow character, I go chat with Mellow Yellow's girlfriend, Lena. She insists that I hunt some Komodo dragons for her. I grab my first yellow element to uplift from a barrel, and I head out. And Hamachi is quite strong, but these initial battles with the Komodo dragons highlight the most obvious shortcoming of yellow characters and elements. They have no in-battle healing at this point. This will be a big issue as we progress. And by the way, I will be allowing consumable elements to be used outside of battle. And if you think that rule invalidates the run, let me know in the comments so I can laugh at you, because this is a silly video about a silly video game. Hamachi quickly dispatches this lizard tyke, and then the big mama dragon comes out. And while this battle is usually a nothing burger in the vanilla run, this big blue doggo can do a ton of damage with her attacks, particularly her own blue elements. But Hamachi is no slouch, and she can dish out impressive physical and yellow elemental damage. She's able to drown this lizard with more than half of her health remaining. And that gets us our first star. Chrono Cross has largely replaced experience with star levels. Every time a boss is beaten, every character, even those who aren't in battle, get a significant stat boost. Hamachi gains two strength points, which is extremely impactful since it increases physical damage dealt. We'll be able to gain some stats eventually when we're not getting a star, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Because now that we've slaughtered some innocent and adorable lizards, we meet up with our girlfriend Lena on the beach. And unfortunately, Hamachi has eaten too much water lizard and has gas, and her fart creates a wormhole, blasting her into another world. And unfortunately, Mellow Yellow follows her through the portal. No one here has any idea who we are or where we came from, but Hamachi is a dog and she doesn't care because everyone will pet her regardless. So we head to Cape Hal, where we find a very useful electro jolt element in a chest. And we also find the reason that nobody remembers Mellow Yellow. He's lazy. But how do I know he's lazy? Well, because he's just been lying in the ground, dead under his tombstone. And unfortunately, our next opponents hate two things. Things, zombies and puppies. So they unalive Hamachi by throwing her off a cliff, meaning we have no yellow characters, and then they cosplay as Holy Water, viciously attacking Mellow Yellow. Fortunately, the rebellious girl now joins the party. So while I can't beat this battle with only yellow characters, I do at least have some extra firepower. Unfortunately though, I forgot to heal Mellow Yellow before this battle, but I give it the old college try, initially focusing my attacks on Pepor and taking him out. But Karsh loves beating a dead horse and he un-unalives Mellow Yellow, and Girl soon follows Fishy Dog and Bubbly Zombie to an early grave. But on my second try, I treat Mellow Yellow to some delicious Alka-Seltzer in tablet form before the battle. Karsh has strong physical attacks and some green text, so I lay into him with our meager physical attacks and our more effective yellow elements. Because he's a green innate, the opposite of yellow, they do excellent damage to him. And equally importantly, they turn the field effect gauge in the top left of the screen to yellow, decreasing the power of his attacks and increasing the power of any additional yellow elements I use. And while it does take a while, I eventually am able to take down Karsh by smashing his head in with a rock. That just leaves Salt and Pepor. And with Karsh gone, the enemy damage output is pretty minimal. No tea, no shade, no sparkling lemonade, but these two clowns get put underground without a sound. That nets us our second star. I also allow Girl to join
join our party, and given that I'm extremely hungry and her hair looks like dessert, I name her Mochi Donut. I didn't really have the naming theme down yet. We'll get there. We'll get there. And after sleeping with her and Hamachi in our childhood bedroom, we strip Mellow Yellow permanently of all of his yellow elements and we donate them to the doggo. Hamachi is now officially our only party member who will do anything in battle. And she's a pretty useful party member, primarily due to her high physical attack power. While I did make a tier list about this game a year or two ago, I ranked Doggo relatively low due to her inability to recover stamina effectively and her poor magic. And her yellow color also played a part. However, as you'll see later, she proved me completely wrong and made me completely unworthy of being her leash master. Her high physical attack means she's not held back by her element color nearly as much as a magical attacker would be. Before we leave town, I recruit Mojo, whom I name French Fry. He won't be able to use any actions, but he does have relatively high evasion, which could come in handy as a passive party member. So I put him in the party, we head through Fossil Valley, grab an egg and a bone, and then we face off against our first real challenge, the second fight against Salt and Pepor. Because they're both yellow innates, our small collection of yellow elements will be largely ineffective against them. Now, these battles typically act as tutorials, and they're meant to be relatively easy. However, with only one character, it's pretty easy to get overwhelmed. Pepor casts Strengthen on himself, increasing the power of his physical attacks, and Salt casts Low Res on Mellow Yellow to decrease his defense. Because he's defending, though, he's relatively unharmed when Pepor lays into him with his box. However, they subsequently use their powerful dual tech crosscut to lay into Poshal. Usually, a character's tech elements have the same color as the character's innate, meaning Salt and Pepor would only have yellow techs, but dual techs, which combine two techs, can have an altogether different elemental affinity. In this case, crosscut is red, meaning it does far more damage to Hamachi than a yellow element would. And soon after, they slap Hamachi with another crosscut tech, but fortunately, she was defending to regain stamina, and she loses far less of her HP. Her next few attacks take out Pepor. However, she's left with just a few HP, and she's taken out by one of Pepor's physical attacks. That's death number two. Fortunately, though, I can make her a little bit stronger before we try again. I mentioned that star levels mostly eliminated grinding in this game, but not completely. In between star battles, character can gain stat boosts after regular battles. It's not infinite, but the gains can be quite impactful. So by having Hamachi massacre some of her own kind, I'm able to get her a few more HP. <laughs> I didn't do it right. She didn't. She didn't get any HP. And we head back to Salt and Pepor to try again. This time, given Pepor's ability to strengthen his attacks, I go after him first. Unfortunately, he targets Hamachi immediately with his Pepor box, but I see it coming and defend to lessen the blow. Unfortunately, again, they then slice and dice my little yellow tail with a crosscut. I'm not in a great position at this point. Hamachi's at low HP, and I've done very little damage. But I continue to focus my NRG on Pepor, bringing him down to critical HP. Fortunately, the duo then starts tackling my other characters, and I'm able to take Pepor down with some more physical attacks. And with only Salt left in the battle, the damage potential is far less. He does use his Somersault technique. Hi, boyfriend. Hi. Did you come to help? Or did you just come to give me a kiss? <laughs> I, there's a cat. This cat, this cat wants to help. He does use his Somersault technique to do some damage, but because he telegraphs it by using low res first, oh my god, cat! But because he telegraphs it by using low res first, I'm able to guard and massively decrease the damage. Hamachi takes him out with a couple more physical attacks, and we head on to Termina. Which is great because we now have access to an element shop, meaning we can buy all the yellow elements we desire. And while Hamachi's magic damage isn't great, casting yellow elements will change the field effect to yellow and increase her physical attack damage. We also head to the blacksmith to give Hamachi some equipment upgrades, namely a copper mail to increase her defensive stats. Now, this part of the game has three branching paths. You recruit one of three characters to escort you to Viper Manor, and the one you recruit determines the way you get there. And since I'm intent on dying as quickly as possible, I recruit P Pierre, the foppish musketeer, whom I named Mountain Blue. And yes, this is where I finally realized the theme of the run. From here on out, all characters will be named after carbonated beverages, mostly. Mountain Blue opens up the opportunity to fight our way directly into Viper Manor. The first fight is with some Acacia Dragoons, and while they can do some respectable damage to Hamachi, she ultimately has no issue taking both out and gets a juicy bunch of stats from their star. However, the second trial of Mountain Blue's pathway comes when we fight Salt, Pepor, and Ketchup. And of course, I forget to heal Mountain Blue and Mellow Yellow before this battle, so Hamachi has to deal with everything on her own. And unfortunately, Pepor has access to the Magma Burst element that not only does a ton of red elemental damage, but it also inflicts the Confusion status effect. So while I would have loved to run from this fight, Hamachi attacks despite the fact that she only has 4 HP left, and she gets taken out by an Electro Jolt. But soldier on we must, and I head back into the fight with Garlic Ranch and Tabasco, this time healing my secondary characters first. Ketchup takes down Mellow 
Yellow Yellow with a massive punch, and in classic tutorial fashion, Salt revives him to illustrate how revival elements work. This time, I target Pepor first, given now I know his tricks, and the battle goes pretty well. That is, until I accidentally fat finger the controls and run away. I love the fact that you can literally run away from any battle in Chrono Cross. This allows you to heal, rearrange elements, and even switch out party members if you're having trouble with a battle. However, it has one drawback. Button inputs are sometimes doubled, which means when trying to select the defend command, it's very easy to double one of the two down commands necessary to scroll to it and hit the run away button instead. But I really needed to vent because this happened on so many battles when I was doing well. Okay, time to try again. Mellow Yellow dead, he gets revived, and then something fun happens. I'm not sure why it didn't happen before, but this time Ketchup uses his flame knock tech. That's the fun gimmick of this battle. He uses salt as a baseball bat and hits the plump Pepor into Mountain Blue, who dies. But so do Salt and Pepor, and that means that if I can survive the big guy alone, the battle is mine. And while he does have some strong attacks, the RNG is on my- Holy f***ing sh I fat fingered the run button. Anyway, Ketchup hits another home run, and Hamachi's physical attacks, while limited due to the fact that she and Ketchup are both yellow innates, are enough to fully squeeze his bottle and gets us our fifth star level. Heading into Viper Manor, I take full advantage of the dragon feeding side quest to get all of its rewards. The most notable ones are a knee pad for feeding the dragons 10 times and iron for feeding the dragons 100 times. In the original game, this was all but impossible on a first playthrough. However, the remaster has a speed down function that's available right from the jump, making this challenge pretty easy. But easy ends now, because while fighting through Viper Manor, I make the mistake of fighting Potty. This is a yellow innate genie monster with powerful elements and attacks, and while I don't die, I run up against another issue. I didn't stock enough tablets in town to keep Hamachi and Party fully healed outside of battle, which means I grab a pendant off the wall and I head into the fight with Lucia's bulbs in terrible shape. These guys are green innate, meaning they do a ton of damage to Hamachi with their physical attacks and elements, and without fully healing Healed meat shields to block their attacks, Hamachi becomes the sole target of a bush basher and she dies. But fortunately, I saved in the dragon's den right after I got the iron vest. That means I don't have to redo this segment and I have all of my tablets back. So we head through the castle, skip fighting Potty this time, and ready our clippers. I focus all of my energy on killing the left bulb initially, hoping for some good initial RNG, and I get it. All three of Hamachi's initial attacks hit, and an electro jolt is enough to take out the first bulb right away, making my allergies only half as bad. Bulb number two does hit a bushwhacker and two physical attacks before Hamachi's stamina recovers, a mechanic that we'll talk about a little bit later, but she eventually retaliates. Bulby gets two more attacks on Hamachi and a bush basher on Mountain Blue, but then Hamachi hits a strong attack for critical damage and removes all plant life from existence forever. I head up to Karsh's room next. Attempting to open his chest 20 times forces him to give up, yielding the extremely useful Dragoon's Gauntlet. This accessory massively increases Hamachi's physical damage and will make future fights much easier. For example, the next fight with Marcy. This little pageant queen has been blessed with a voracious bloodlust and a panoply of blue elements and techs. I start as usual with three physical attacks from Hamachi, and Marcy retaliates with a relatively weak punch. In my next round, though, I perform two physical attacks and an electro jolt to strengthen Hamachi's next set of physical attacks and get in some burst damage. Marcy counters, though, with her cat's cradle tech, which kinda hurts. Unfortunately, I have a big miss on my next set of physical attacks and I use Hamachi's canine ball tech to bring this hellspawn down to critical health. Unfortunately though, this is where this beauty queen gets rough. When she reaches critical health, Marcy uses the ice blast spell, freezing characters in place and making them unable to move. And she uses it twice. Fortunately though, she uses both casts on Mellow Yellow. That takes him out and leaves Hamachi free to number one, get some horrible RNG and miss two of her three attacks, and number two, finish Marcy off with an electro jolt so I can unclench my anus. But not for long, because our our next enemy is the mortal enemy of dogs, daddies. I mean, cats. And Lynx is a formidable opponent, or at least that's what I thought, but the final boss of the game, as I alluded to before, is the run button, which I accidentally hit after my first attempt of this fight. But I head back in, and this time RNGesus is not on my side, and Lynx bears down on Hamachi, both with physical attacks, which are quite potent, and his Gravitone ability. And by the way, here's something weird. Gravitone is a black area of effect spell, but some opponents have the ability to cause Gravitone to hit just one opponent for its full damage amount. 
account. Lynx is one of these enemies, and his targeting Hamachi with this spell means she heads into critical HP. And then he bears down again, bringing her down to 13. And then he attacks her again, destroying her completely. And I decide to press my luck again with a party that isn't fully healed because I'm out of tablets. And this is a mistake. Lynx takes down Hamachi almost immediately. And on my next attempt, Lynx starts by hitting Mellow Yellow and Mountain Blue, leaving Hamachi at full health. Her attacks all seem to be hitting, and my run button is on its best behavior. By the time he starts attacking Hamachi, he's taken a ton of damage, and I've managed to control the field effect, keeping it mostly yellow. Things get close, and Mountain Blue eventually goes down, and Hamachi ends up at low HP. But she has full stamina, so I hit a moderate attack, and then get an amazing critical hit on a strong attack, but he's not dead yet. So I decide to just go for damage and hit him with a K9 ball. And that doesn't kill him either. But to my surprise, he uses Imbecile on Hamachi, lowering her magic defense, but doing zero damage. This opens up an opportunity, and I kill him with just one more physical attack. But unfortunately, it's revealed that the pussycat we've been searching for is in another castle, and the real Lynx poisons our mochi donuts. And I'm a little upset, because I was gonna eat those, dude. But rather than throw away our mochi donuts, we decide to save them for a reason that you will find out in just a little bit. In order to do that, though, we have to head back to Hamachi's homeworld and fight the Hydra in the swamp. But not before we dismantle our Profiteer's purse to make some iron equipment for Hamachi, boosting both her offense and her defense. And that's great, because our next battle is with this Biba. And this battle, Biba hard. After a few turns, the Biba summons a reinforcement Biba, and he can do this up to three times. In a vanilla coke run, this battle is pitifully easy. Your three characters can take out the summoner Biba well before he can summon all three reinforcements. But Hamachi is going to have a lot of trouble here. She and the Biba are both yellow innate, meaning she does reduce damage to them with her physical attacks. And while one Biba isn't particularly powerful physically, four Biba Biba much harder to wall. There is simply no way for Hamachi to kill the main Biba before it summons friends. So I need another plan. And my initial thought is, what if I just skip the Biba battle and go straight to the dwarves? I don't miss anything by not fighting the Bibas. The reward for this arc is Razli, whom I can't use anyway. So I grab a few mini levels, gaining some juicy HP, and I fight the Dwarf Horde. Fortunately, their High Ho Chorus attack does very little to her, but it becomes apparent very quickly that this is going to be a losing battle. It's six against one, and while physical attacks aren't too bad, they completely overpower her with yellow elements, and I die. My idea was bad. So I grab another mini level, and it's a juicy one. But I keep fighting, and that was a mistake because I come across one of these cage things that remind me of the similar monsters from Final Fantasy IX, and it destroys me. Funny story though, I actually kill it first, but the poison effect it inflicted with Bush Basher kills me at the same time. This moment is literally the first time I've ever died from a status effect in Chrono Cross. Fortunately, even though I hadn't saved before the last mini level, I get the exact same stat ups, and this is by design. Friend of the channel Super Handy made a short video about how leveling works in Chrono Cross, and I will link that video in the discreetly do for you to watch after this one. But anyway, after this mini level, it's back to Biba. And I have one of the weirdest realizations I have ever had in a video game. So normally when I fight the Bibas, I focus on the summoner Biba, hoping I can kill him before he summons the final Biba. This never works, and I don't expect it to, but there is something else. After the Biba summons its final friend, I get it to critical HP, as evidenced by the fact that it's clutching its pot belly. It tries to summon another friend who doesn't come, and then I attack it, and look, look, he's no longer at critical HP. HP. The game is cheating. But hey, this gave me some inspiration for a path through. Instead of focusing my energy on the summoner Biba, I attack his first summoned Biba. This one will not recover his HP with no discernible mechanic, and I'm able to take him out relatively quickly, changing our matchup to 3 to 1 instead of 4 to 1. And from there, it's just a matter of not missing too many attacks. Biba 2 goes down, Biba 3 goes down, and then all that's left is the summoner Biba. And I know I can take him one on one. He gets down to critical HP, I miss a couple attacks, but finally, I finish him off with a critical hit on my strong attack. Dang, that was frustrating. And that cheater Biba gives us the Biba Flute, and we use that flute to summon the Wingipede, who Biba an incredibly powerful green enemy. Fortunately though, because he's green, Hamachi does additional damage with every single attack. Do I accidentally run away from this battle? Yes. Do I try again? Yes. Hamachi does a ton of damage with her attacks, but her Canine Ball both does great damage and switches the field effect, and within a few minutes, the Wingipede falls. And that was surprising surprisingly easy, all things considered. So we fall into the hole it creates with its giant shaft, and we fight the Pentapussy. Unfortunately, it does not step its Pentapussy up, and Hamachi completely steamrolls her, not even losing half her health. And that means we recruit Razli, whom I name
name Mountain Pew. And now we face the Dwarf Horde a second time. Hi Ho Chorus is now doing significantly less damage now that we've gotten a mini level. And oh shit, I ran away by accident again. Okay, Hi Ho Chorus. And then I attack the dwarves and I work on a Daggy Dwarf initially, but another Hi Ho Chorus wrecks my team before I can kill it off. But at this point, I get a look at who performs the Hi Ho Chorus. It requires a dwarf, a Daggy Dwarf, and a Daffy Dwarf. And in this battle, there is one dwarf, two Daggy Dwarfs, and three Daffy Dwarfs. So in order to prevent Hi Ho Chorus, I need to remove one of those categories of dwarf from the battle. But there's a problem here. Once the main dwarf is destroyed, all of the Daffy Dwarfs are prompted to use their strong elements, including the devastating Electro Bolt. So they must be taken out before the main dwarf. It takes me a few more tries and a few more deaths to realize it, but there's an ideal strategy for this battle. Do you want to know the ideal strategy for this battle? Because here's the ideal strategy for this battle. I can take out a Daggy Dwarf in one round, which I must do, and then I take out the second Daggy Dwarf as well, disabling a high hole chorus completely. After that, I leave the main dwarf alone and I aim for the Daffy Dwarf since I can't deal with their elements if the big guy goes down. The Daggy Dwarves go down pretty quickly and now all of the dwarves only use normal attacks, which do paltry damage to yellow dogfish. I wrap up by killing the main dwarf and we're finally past this monstrosity of a battle and on to another one, the Hydra. But Hamachi has a bit of an advantage in this battle. Both the Hydra and Hamachi are yellow innates, meaning we have quite a bit of resistance against its attacks. However, her attacks, of course, are also resisted, meaning this battle is pretty slow going. But fortunately, the Hydra doesn't seem to favor attacking Hamachi too much and even better, mainly uses single physical attacks at a time. When it hits low health, it uses Wave of Fear to lower my team's defense and it uses Spirits Up to raise its own. It also uses the Putrid Odor attack, which puts Hamachi at low HP. But it's too little too late and Hamachi's consistent physical damage is enough to skin this snake and get us our Hydra humor. So we return to Goldove with Korcha, who at some point I named Coldplay, which is not a soda, theme failed. And back in Goldove, we cleanse our Mochi Donut. But now little Mel gets hungry for Mochi Donut as well. She steals Mochi Donut's elements and after we hunt her down, she, well, she literally does nothing. And on leaving Goldove, we are gifted a boat. And by the way, being gifted one is the only way that you should ever acquire a maritime vessel. Don't buy a boat. It's a mistake. Anyway, by immediately returning to Goldove with more Mochi Donuts for Mel, we can entice her to join our party. That means that we now have two yellow characters in our party, which is amazing because this is no longer a solo run. And we name her Squirt. And one more thing about Squirt, she also has the Snatch technique. That allows us to steal, which will be quite useful. But beyond being another body who can attack and cast spells, other uses are incredibly limited. Her physical attacks are pitiful, her defenses are meager, and her magic stat is mediocre. But fortunately, she's not the only buff we get to our team at this point. We now get access to capsules. These are the first and only yellow healing element we'll get for the entire run. Well, there might actually be one a little bit later. These are a consumable level three element, and that's the only slot in which they can be equipped. They always heal a flat 80 HP, but in addition, because they're yellow and five of them can be equipped in each slot, they can be used as a quick way to control the field effect gauge. For example, in our next challenge with the elusive Shantus Harl. To be fair, this battle isn't anything special, but I make a huge mistake here. Squirt can steal the moon glasses from Harl. That's an accessory that provides a 25% reduction to all types of damage taken. However, it's a rare steal and Mel instead steals a photon beam. And that's a great element, but it's useless in this run because it's white elemental. The moon glasses would have greatly increased my character's viability in this run, and I wish I'd just taken the time to reset and steal them. But I didn't. And so I take Carl down, which means next it's time to tackle the ghost ship. Upon boarding, though, we realize it's actually just a standard pirate ship, and Fargo forces us to fight through his gauntlet. First, against three man of wars, which are basically just a random encounter. But I realize another interesting quirk about this battle here. After Squirt fails to snatch anything from them, I run from the battle with the intent of stealing. But rather than forcing me to fight the battle again, the game simply progresses me to the next battle with Polly the Dragon. With my new capsules and two party members, Polly is nothing more than a hot pocket, and we micro wave her to golden brown perfection. And Polly yields to Fargo. And okay, this is a stupid critique, but the shading on him is super weird. The parts of him that are sun exposed, like his cheekbones and the area above his eyebrows, are super pale. And all the other parts look like they got into a fight with a tanning machine and lost. I think maybe they were trying to shade him to show where the light is actively hitting him, but it did not work out. It looks like they placed a reverse filter on him. Anyway, similar to the battle with Polly, Fargo is no match for the physical prowess of Hamachi. I do use the high res element with Squirt, as well as some of 
offensive magic, but it's pretty unimportant. Against two characters and with the power of capsules, Fargo doesn't stand a chance. He even desperately uses a powerful green element, Carnivore, but his magic stat isn't high enough to cause any danger to my team. However, even though we win, pirates play dirty and Fargo is no different. He uses Jellyfish Tranquilizer to capture the team and send us below deck. And after we search the cabin for the key, we recruit Little Pip, whom we name Starry. Now, Starry is an interesting character and actually is usable in this challenge. Depending on what elements Star uses and elements are used against Starry, they'll evolve from white into one of the six elements. So I could take the time to capsule up Starry and turn them yellow, but given that we're about to nuke our entire team for spoiler reasons, I decide it's not worth my time to create yellow Starry and we move on to the next boss, Deadhead. Starry will remain benched for the entire rest of the game. But Deadhead is kind of interesting. It always starts off by using the Diminish element, which halves the damage of all elements. And that suits me just fine. Elements tend to be the big killer in this run, so having their damage is actually great. And even better, the healing power of capsules and other consumable elements aren't affected by Diminish. So this boss has basically just done me a favor. But there's a problem. His breath attack inflicts the darkness status, which severely reduces accuracy. And in order to cast elements, in particular healing elements like my capsules, I have to hit physical attacks. No physical attacks means no element power. But the darkness status soon wears off. I heal judiciously and we take him down, now ready to head to Fort Dragonia. Well, not quite. I have one more area to conquer, Water Dragon Isle. Before I go though, I head to Marbule to grab some yellow trap elements. These will allow me to round out my element collection with a level 5 to 7 yellow elements, which can do great damage. I just gotta trap them first. But after that, we head to Water Dragon Isle, where the dwarves have taken over, and this suits me just fine. Number one, because we nab a star level from a dwarf horde that strongly resembles the one we fought in the swamp, but weaker. And we have two characters instead of one this time, so they go down quick. But the second reason I'm happy the dwarves are here is that I can get a ton of powerful elements from them. They often spontaneously drop the powerful Electro Bolt element. And do you remember the earthquake traps I just purchased? Well, I bet you can guess what's going to happen. I can manipulate the dwarves to cast Earthquake. Specifically, in this particular enemy formation, if you kill the Daggy and Daffy dwarf and get the final dwarf to critical HP, it will cast Earthquake an infinite number of times. And access to this element gives me strong AoE damage and will make future battles, particularly random battles, roll along much more easily. But one thing that will not roll along easily is the high ho tank. What did I just call myself? This tank is yellow innate, but it can shoot powerful elemental shots at my characters of any element, including green. It also comes with two helpers. And while they're weak, they can interrupt my attack chain and just make life generally miserable. So physical attacks plus an earthquake or two from Squirt takes out the reinforcements and then I accidentally run from battle again. I want a confirm button for the run screen because of my fat fingers. Anyway, same plan the second time. This time, Squirt gets hit with a blue element shot to start and once again the sidekicks are taken out. Some capsules get Squirt more healthy but then she gets down to just 8 HP after another blue element shot. I focus all of my energy on getting her health back up and then Hamachi takes a green element shot to the face. Like dude, that's not the kind of facial I asked for. Fortunately though, because I've only been using yellow elements, the green element facial is far less impactful than it might have been. And eventually all of my physical attacks take their toll on the tank and Hamachi butt blasts this metallic monstrosity to finish it off. So I think it's a great example of how I should handle most battles as the game continues. Rather than use my turns to cast elements and do burst damage, it's nope. far more important most of the time to play slow and steady, chipping away or sometimes chunking away health with physical attacks, using my elements only to heal. Field control by itself, which is accomplished reasonably quickly with capsules, is hugely impactful. And as my character's physical attacks power up, the percentage increase in power I'll get from making the field yellow will also be compounded. With the dwarves out of its realm, the water dragon yields up its ice breath to us, and it's finally time to head back to another world and into Fort Dragonia. But first, we need to fight our way through Mount Pyre, and there are three bosses that block our path. The first are Salt and Pepor, who provide another tutorial about traps. We clearly know all about traps already, so while their stat boost from their star is appreciated, their mansplaining is not. Fortunately though, this battle is designed to be a simple affair, and neither Paprika nor Celery have anything powerful to hit us with. And our newly gained earthquakes don't hurt either, allowing Squirt to hit them both at once. But now it's time for boss number two, the Fire Dragon. As a red innate, his damage won't be markedly reduced by our character's spells. Fortunately though, the Fire Dragon only does single target damage. That means that a capsule from both characters can heal enough to negate any damage he does. So as you might expect, he gets pushed aside rather quickly. But the third boss battle is a significant obstacle. We now fight the three Dragoon Devas, Zoa, Karsh, and Marcy. All three can cause huge problems for my team. Marcy, as before, can freeze, Karsh is green elemental and therefore does super effective damage, and 
Zoa as a yellow innate takes reduced damage from all of our attacks. For the sake of survivability, I start by going after Karsh, who does manage to get off a powerful Axial Axe before getting taken down by an Earthquake. Marcy then hits with her powerful String Phone tech, but that's all she's able to do before I take her down with a Pink Doggo. And with only Zoa left, the battle is looking extremely manageable. It takes a while due to the Elemental Resistance, but he too gets smashed, this time by Hamachi's Canine Ball, and we get our final Mount Pyre Star and an amazing set of bonuses. So into Fort Dragonia we go, grabbing all of the treasures, even though they're useless because I can't help myself. But one useful treasure is the Electro Bolt and the Yellow Puzzle section. Could I have skipped it? Absolutely. But listen, I can't do it. I literally can't do it. I have a problem. Even when I'm not 100%ing a game, I want to 100% the game. In any case, I have two potential bosses I can fight next. Big Green Cow or Big Blue Blob. Given that I fear the damage from my Verdant Bovine friend, I elect to hit Big Blue Blob first. But this boss is not free. And to start things off, Blob takes in Mellow Yellow and freezes him. And this is actually quite a stellar bit of RNG since freeze is quite a difficult status effect to combat. Squirt hits hard with earthquakes in this fight due to her stronger than Hamachi's but not amazing magic stat, and even Hamachi does better damage to this boss with magic than physical attacks. That's a testament to this boss's resistance. I do make the mistake of using Canine Ball instead of magic on one turn, but it still does more damage than her physical attacks. I also get a second stroke of luck, and Blob uses Ice Blast on Mellow Yellow again, this time killing him. Had it used the spell on either of my yellows, life would have gotten a lot worse, but I count my blessings in this particular case. Fortunately, the worst thing this boss does after killing Mellow Yellow is another taken attack on Hamachi, freezing her. But Squirt keeps him alive and finishes off the battle with a final upheaval and all is right as Blobby Rain. By the way, Blob's attacks also caused flu, and one of the things I love about this game is how status effects impact character movement. The flu status, for example, causes your characters to run in a meandering pattern like they're dizzy, and the sprain status forces your characters to walk instead of run on the map. These statuses can stack, and since there are no random battles in this game, you only fight enemies you run into, these statuses can force you to fight more battles and then be somewhat debilitated in the battles themselves. I haven't seen many games tackle out of battle status effects, and I love the way that Chrono Cross handled it. It's immersive, and I think it's pretty neat. Anyway, we stumble over to the Minty Moo Moo. This monster focuses mostly on offense, having pretty meager physical defenses and similarly paltry magic ones. However, he's green innate, meaning all of my attacks and elements do a ton of damage. But he has a nasty surprise. After any element is used against him, he uses Heal All, restoring some health, but more importantly, influencing the field elements and therefore increasing his own damage. He also has powerful physical techniques to take full advantage of that field gauge, like Body Press, and that does over half of Squirt's max HP and damage. However, maybe you can see what the strategy is here. Capsules will both heal me and force the field to yellow, increasing my damage and decreasing his. And he doesn't counter my restoration elements with Heal All, meaning I can quickly run him through. That being said, Squirt still does great damage with Earthquake, about 30 times more than she can do with her physical attacks and 5 times more than he can heal, so it makes perfect sense to just have her cast Earthquake whenever she can. The math is a little more shaky with Hamachi, so while I do have her use some elements for the sake of speeding through the battle, I mostly elect to have her physically attack and heal to modify field effect. Things do get a bit dicey when Mumu uses two physical attacks in a row on Hamachi, but she and Squirt are able to relatively quickly heal off the damage with two capsules. This battle ends up being far easier than I had hoped, with Hamachi bopping him to death with a final physical attack. Now before we can ascend to the top floor, there's just one more boss battle against Golden Sun. Now usually my goal in this battle in a casual run is to capture a holy light element, but since we can use neither white elements nor white trap elements in battle, I focus my attention completely on snuffing his light. The biggest danger of this battle is Meteor Shower, which causes the fatigue status. This status causes characters' physical attacks to use more stamina, making it more difficult to perform successive attacks. But with two units instead of one, this isn't too impactful and we're able to relatively quickly plunge the world into eternal darkness. And then, upon ascending, we've come full circle. This is where the game started, the landscape of the dream at the beginning of the game. But before continuing on, I head back to Marbule to replenish my supply of capsules because we're going to need a lot of them for the fights ahead. Because the next boss is Evil Peppa Pig, whom you might know as Bunyip. This guy starts as a Renanate, and normally I try to capture all sorts of neat elements off this guy, Volcano, Inferno, Freefall, but since we don't get to use black or red trap elements, that's not going to be possible. And that's a problem, because it means we have to tank his massive element damage instead. And he starts with an Inferno, which also inflicts the burn status and lowers our defenses. But fortunately, we're able to take him into form 2, his black innate form, almost immediately after that, and I make the mistake of casting Earthquake with Squirt instead of immediately healing. That means that I leave Hamachi at low HP and I fall a bit behind. And while I do heal her as quickly as possible, 
possible, Bunyip's strong freefall attack is enough to take her out, forcing me to run. But hey, at least it wasn't an accident this time. On attempt number two, I start out quite similarly, once again scrambling to heal after a big hot blast attack. And on transformation, we have Squirt almost at full HP and Hamachi in a very comfortable position after a capsule. Gravitone isn't too impactful and she makes some big gains. Freefall unfortunately though hits Squirt, which brings her down to critical HP and forces my hand with another capsule. And Hamachi doesn't have the element level to heal Squirt, so a Devil Thunder brings her back down low. But after that, things start going my way. I'm able to heal Hamachi at least to a reasonable level, and while I'm definitely scrambling a bit, things are definitely more comfortable the second time around. I focus most of my element energy on healing, and Hamachi survives a free fall, meaning I'm in a pretty good place. And the rest of the battle is relatively uneventful. Squirt hits a strong earthquake, and Hamachi bops Peppa Devil Pig back into the cruel hell he came from. And with that, we prepare to close out the first half of the game. We start off with a battle against Viper, who, as a yellow innate, can't do much to us. But Squirt does steal a priceless stamina ring off of him. And with patience, and honestly only a moderate bit of healing because of his poor offense against us, Viper very quickly gets wrecked, yielding star number 20. He also yields a very valuable Dragoon Gauntlet upon his demise. But now, it's time to fight the evil pussycat, even though that statement is redundant. All cats are evil. That's why we love them. And the only way to describe this battle is fascinating. With only yellow teammates, Lynx's attacks definitely lack power. Much of his combat is based around his ability to use powerful black techniques like glide hook against characters, but Hamachi really doesn't give a fuck. She takes minimal damage even with almost completely black field effect, and Squirt's magic damage still carries. Interestingly, in a vanilla run, Lynx often counters with anti-white, preventing the party from using their most powerful techs. But in this battle, he really only plays around with attacks and offensive elements, none of which have too much bite. Squirt's doodle takes him down to critical HP, and Hamachi ultimately finishes him off with a physical attack. That means that the battle I was dreading the most in the top half is actually no big deal. But now we have a bit of a paradigm shift. We become the cute black kitty we once feared, and we make our way into the dimensional vortex. There, we grab one of my favorite characters, Sprig, whom we name Ice-T. And Ice-T's existence creates a little wrinkle in this challenge that forced me to rethink my rules a bit. Currently, we have no yellow innate characters in our party, but Ice-T has the ability to transform into any generic monster she has previously defeated. And per the rules, as I mentioned before, my non-yellow innate characters can only use their weakest attacks and yellow elements. But if Ice-T transforms into a yellow monster, I'll have a yellow innate character in the party and regular rules will apply. So the rule will be that until I get another yellow innate character, Ice-T will be my only battler. She has to transform as quickly as possible unless she's gaining a new yellow transformation. We recruit Harl before leaving the dimensional vortex. And fortunately, to prevent people from correcting me for mispronouncing her name, I name her Coke. We emerge in the swamp and fortunately the swamp is home to a yellow innate enemy, the Biba. And since I'm itching for revenge, Ice-T fights and captures one. That means we now have a de facto yellow character we can use. However, in order to use this transformation, we must use one non-yellow element, Ice-T's transform tech. So any battle in which we use Ice-T will increase our non-yellow element usage by one. And I think I could make an argument for not counting transform given that it doesn't do any damage and it literally is required to turn her into a yellow enemy. But what do you think? Like I'm literally making the game harder by using this rule. Anyway, this is both good and bad. It's good because we now have a yellow element character that we can use in battle, which means we can't use everyone else. And the next battle is with a green innate character, Radius. And in fact, the first time I try out this battle, Radius immediately pursues the Bebenator with his first set of physical attacks and his long shot tech, meaning I need to run immediately. And of course that counts as a death since my only yellow character died. Now there is something interesting about Ice-T's transformations. Almost all equipment that she can wear is useless. Once she transforms, the only equipment that has any use is the earrings. This increased total HP beyond the character's maximum, which means they can give Justin Biba just a little bit more bulk and every little bit counts in this battle. But what really counts is RNG. Basically, in order for me to win this battle, literally everything needs to go right. Radius needs to attack Lynx and Coke with all of his single target attacks so that Beebarill can survive the multi-target attacks he uses. Mr. Beebs needs not to miss any attacks so that he can both get all of his physical damage in and have enough elemental devils to use his elements. And that, as you probably guessed, is key to preventing Radius from doing a ton of damage with his green techs. And that definitely doesn't happen on my second try. Or my third, fourth, or fifth. On my sixth try though, I actually use my B brain and realize that Biba has access to negate physical. That will prevent Radius from hitting me with any physical attacks and greatly increase my longevity. 
longevity. So now I'm actually hoping that Radius does attack the Beeble with physical attacks, but not with magical attacks. Photon Beam hits Lynx, Inferno hits the entire team for massive damage, but then I get a stroke of luck. Radius starts attacking Beeble with physical attacks, which is exactly what I want. And then I make a brilliant play. I accidentally run away from the battle again. Help. But next time I realize another fun thing. Radius's physical attacks are also neutered by negate physical. I mean, I'm still forced to run because my Beeb is getting low on HP, but hey, that's nifty. And the next time, Radius focuses elemental attacks on Lynx and Kook. And once Kook dies, Radius primarily uses physical attacks and techs, which do nothing. So I wickety wickety whack and I use a thunderstorm to give this old man a heart attack. And a few more strikes with my umbrella are enough to break both of his hips and finish this battle. Which of course means that we invite him to join our party. And we call him Monster. And with that battle, we will only be using yellow characters for the rest of the game. Because now we can grab Norris from Termina, who joins our party completely for free. And since he uses a gun, we call him Fountain. And as an added bonus, by heading to the forest, grabbing a strange mushroom and feeding it to this random dude, we can acquire Fungi, whom we name Moo Pop. We also grab Zappa while we're in Termina, and we name him Dr. Pepsmith. With his Smith spirit, we can now customize weapons and armor everywhere, which will be super useful. We use some of our acquired mithril to create silver equipment, we re-equip our characters with all the yellow elements we can, and I'm ready to go. Before we progress the plot, though, we head to the bottom of the ocean to grab the star fragment, an item that will be completely necessary to completing the game. Because in order to complete the game, we need Starkey, and he won't join us until we have the star fragment. And also, he won't join us until we beat him in a battle. And while he does have a lot of powerful white elements to bash us with, our newly acquired yellow duo makes the fight a lot more reasonable than you might expect. Both Fountain and Moopop do good but not amazing physical and magical damage. That being said, it's at this point in the game that healing starts to become an issue again. With max HP levels in the high 200s, 80 HP of healing just isn't that much. And that's particularly true with the fatigue status in play, which will limit our ability to build up our element levels. But Starkey's damage isn't too overwhelming, particularly when the field effect is all yellow. He eventually goes down and he Stockholm syndromes himself into our party. And we name him, oh crap, I hit the button before I could rename him. Well, let's pretend I named him Fresca. We also recruit Vaughn, whom I named Surge, who has no relation to our main character, make a detour to Fort Dragonia to grab a free thunderstorm element, have a close encounter with an irritable mermaid, get transformed into some thieving cats by an amateur magician, and head to the Grand Slam to meet the Sage of Marbule. And while you might think the Sage of Marbule would be a difficult enemy, his AI has an interesting quirk that we can exploit. If you use elements against him, he'll cast a turn element and then an element of the opposing type against you. But if you just physically attack him, all he'll do is physically attack back. And as it turns out, the yellow element has a spell that completely breaks this fight so long as you don't attack with magic. Negate physical. Yes, just like the Biba, your yellow innate characters can use this element to dodge all physical attacks and physical techs. And initially I do use this, but then I realize that the sage's attacks aren't that threatening anyway, so I just smash him, grab star 23, and plunder his fiddler crab. Now, I could at this point head on to the Grand Slam to get some useful items, but there's a problem. The Grand Slam requires you to use the monsters that Ice-T has captured, and to maintain the rules of this challenge, I'd have to only use yellow innate monsters. And since we now have yellow characters in our party, I can't capture any until much later. So I skip that for now, and I recruit Sneff, whom I name Krabby Cola. We use our crab to open up the Dead Sea, but the evil sword Mazamoon is in our way, and the only way to fight it is with another sword, the Einlancer. To get it, we have to grab Grai's keepsake from Monster Hideout, and then we fight the keepsake's namesake in the Isle of the Damsake. And Garai is not fun. True, he does have physical attacks that can be blocked by Negate Fizz, but are his techs physical? No, they are not, despite the fact that he slashes you with a sword. And they do a ton of damage. He generally follows a pretty consistent pattern. He attacks for two turns and then uses a tech on his next turn. And usually, by the time you've built up your elements, he'll get a tech in and you're forced to heal or risk death, meaning you don't have time to recast Negate Fizz. And why do you need to heal? Well, because his Willbreaker tech does over 200 damage, meaning you must be at high health to survive it. But I make the mistake of not healing right away the first time I do this battle. However, he does physically attack Moopop, who has Fizz Negate status, so it does very little. But his triple cut takes Fountain down to low health next. Still, RNG is somewhat on my side, and he attacks Moopop, who negates, wastes his Willbreaker on Lynx, and utterly destroys him. And then he attacks Fountain again. But my health is pretty low at this point, and while I try to heal up, he eventually takes out Moopop with a Willbreaker. So let's talk about star levels a little bit more while you watch a few more of my failures. Star levels, as I mentioned before, give bonus stats to all of your characters. But of the characters in battle, it only gives stats 
deaths to those who are alive, which means unless I want this challenge to be even harder than it already is, I need both characters to be alive at the end of every single boss battle. And this need results in me running away from this fight about a million times in an attempt to finally get the RNG I need to win. Healing is just a huge issue, but I want to keep our non-yellow element count as low as possible, and I know I can win this battle. It's just going to take time. A lot of time. And spoilers, an hour and a half after my first attempt, I finally get the run. I get negate fizz up on Moop Hop and Fountain relatively quickly, and given that everyone is at high HP and Garai goes after my two yellow characters with physical attacks, I take advantage of the opportunity to cast an Earthquake and a Thunderstorm. Garai takes down Lynx with his first tech, which is perfect because it grants me time to recast negate fizz before it wears off. By the way, one of my frustrations with this game is that there's no indicator to tell you when a buff has worn off. That means one second physical attacks will miss because negate physical is active and the next they'll hit. So I just try to reapply them early when I know they're still up. And anyway, while his techs are powerful, having his physical attacks neutralized for the entirety of the battle means I can weather them. It still takes a bit of luck. I need Garai to alternate his techs a reasonable amount to make sure my high HP party member takes the hit when the other is low. But still, even with great strategy, the end of the battle is a gamble. Once Garai goes into his critical HP animation, I need to burst him down as quickly as possible as my characters are now both at low HP. That means it's death if he gets in another tech. And one final earthquake along with another mushroom strike takes him down, getting our 24th star and one of the best star levels for Moopop I've ever seen. So now that we have our sword, we can head into the Dead Sea. And our next battle is with the Highwayman. And this boss, while not as punishing as Garai, still does provide a challenge. And it does this with its exhaust gas tech, which causes the darkness status effect on all of our characters, making it all but impossible to earn element levels. It can also do a ton of damage with its other techs. So on my first try, I get up my Fizz Negate status, Moopop gets darkened, and then Fountain almost gets taken out. But things go well once I gain control over the battle. I get the field to yellow and my attacks and elements are able to do a ton of damage, but ultimately the darkness status really screws me over. Both Moopop and Fountain find it hard to hit their attacks and Tank Man's Rampage destroys Moopop in one hit, meaning it's time to run. Basically, I need to keep both Fountain and Moopop at full health for the entire fight. This means negate physical is mandatory and almost all of my element levels will be used on healing with capsules. Try number two starts off excellently, but Fountain is one hit KO'd by a Rampage and we try again. On try number three, Moopop gets attacked right away, meaning he's already in danger and I gotta run. And after try four fails magnificently, I realized that I have another option here. I didn't participate in any battles after Garai, meaning I can get a full mini level by doing a few battles, making this battle much easier. And the mini level I get is just stellar. Strength and res for both Moopop and Fountain. So I try again. After negating physical and dodging some attacks, both characters dodge darkness, meaning I can get element levels and cure Moopop from near death. I take a slight detour to cast Thunderstorm and get some big damage, but then it's back to the status quo with more healing. And this time, darkness only hits Fountain, meaning Moopop can get more element levels and heal. And then RNGesus really shows that he's on my side. The tank attacks Lynx with Rampage, giving me more chances to heal. Unfortunately though, my negate Fizz is now down, and I take a bunch of physical damage before refreshing it and healing Moopop with another capsule. And this choice serves me well, since we have a few more physical attacks before the next exhaust gas attack, and I'm able to get both characters back to full HP before Rampage. Moopop survives, although just barely, and we begin the cycle anew. Moopop eventually gets down to critical health, but we've delayed both his and Fountain's death long enough that he's able to take down the tank and get us yet another star level. But if you know this game, you know that things are about to get nasty. Because our next boss is Miguel. Miguel has powerful white techs and elements, and he's able to exert amazing element control by casting debuffs before all of his spells. And initially, I go with a similar strategy. Negate physical and then heal after Miguel casts his opening holy drag sword. But then he reveals his next move. He casts turn black on Fountain, making him weak to white elements, and then he casts photon beam. And the photon beam directly hits that weakness. But fortunately, this is far less robust than his techs. However, the second time he casts holy drag sword, he attacks Lynx, which is the best possible outcome. But the next photon beam inflicts fatigue on Moopop, meaning we once again have stamina issues. Cutting to the chase though, Miguel's cycle allows ample time for healing, but eventually he casts Holy Drag Sword on a not-so-healthy Fountain that knocks him out and leaves only Moopop. And while I would love for Fountain to get this star level, the RNG was so good that I can't leave this run behind. I don't want to do this fight again. I refuse to do this fight again. He uses Meteor Shower, which is not enough to kill. He uses Holy Light, which is not enough to kill. He Strong Minds and Weak Minds and Holy Drag Swords, which is not enough to kill. And then he just bops me and I die. So, you know, that was 
is all for nothing. Anyway, I only make one change to my equipment for the second try. I give Fountain the Silver Pendant for just a little bit more magic resistance. And I get Miguel down to critical health again, but this time, a Meteor Shower takes down a critically ill Moopop. But try number three has to go better. I get some big damage on him right away with Thunderstorm, and he takes out Lynx right away with Holy Drag Sword. That's the best thing that could have happened. Long story short, we get him to critical HP, and his Meteor Shower kills neither Moopop nor Fountain. His Holy Light, though, does, but Fountain is able to rally, and this time I take the hit and I'm okay with missing the star level on Moopop. After a long back and forth, Fountain takes out Miguel, destroying the Dead Sea and keeping a delicious star level completely to himself. And while I was a little bit disappointed by this, it ended up not mattering much for a reason that we'll discuss later. So now that Miguel and the Dead Sea are the dead Miguel and the dead Dead Sea, we can return to another world and pursue our old body. On the way though, we grab our first rainbow shell in another world's Arnie village and head back to Termina. There, we're able to recruit Zoa, whom we name Can, and we put him in the party in lieu of Moopop. Zoa's strength is ultimately superior, though his big weakness in this challenge is his lower stamina recovery. However, we'll eventually have a way to remedy that. We head back to Viper Manor, grab Can's level 7 tech out of a box in his room, and traverse the sewers. On the way though, I think twice about Can's poor stamina recovery and put Moopop back into the party to face this disgusting bug, Rochester. Since his attacks are mostly physical, negate physical and a bunch of yellow elements are enough to take him down pretty easily. So we make our way into the prison next. There, we face our next set of challenges, beginning with Hell's Cook. He starts the battle with extremely weak elements, and that's the exact opening we need to burn his toast with physical attacks and powerful yellow magic. He wastes the turn with a pitiful healing spell and then returns to casting weak elements. And that's enough leeway for us to take him down with a few more physical attacks. He then reverts back to Orcha, the Heaven Chef, and joins our party, and we name him Dr. Pepper. And that leads right into the fight with Grobeck. And with the help of Negate Fizz, Grobeck is a complete pushover as well. He does have some powerful black techs, but since his techs are physical, they're completely neutralized. He even uses Vigora to get a near infinite string of attacks, but since none of them can hit, he has an infinite string of attacks that all miss, and he goes down to an Electro Bolt within a couple of minutes. But next up is the big old robot. The strategy is much the same. Negate his strong physical attacks and hit hard with elements. The robot is yellow innate, so things take a bit longer, but he's not at all challenging since his physical attacks do almost nothing and his techs are also yellow. That means my team takes minimal damage from them, and on beating him, Grobic joins our party, and we call him Coke Zero. And winning this battle actually triggers a slurry of recruitments. Riddell becomes Cream Soda, Viper becomes Werner, Fargo transforms into Calypso, Marcy transmutes into Big Blue, and Car Sailor Moons into 7-Up. And at this point, since he missed a star level anyway, I replace Moopop with Werner to form what will be my final soda party of the game, a fountain full of Werners. You're gonna love to watch him shoot. So Coke now leaves the party, and it's time to pop some bubbly and fight a bunch of dragons. But before I do that, I have some mucus-colored business to take care of. First, I head back to the swamp and capture a golem summon. It'll do a ton of damage to every enemy in the game, but I'll have to get the field completely yellow to use it. However, we'll get some tools later that will make that a lot easier. I also grab Fountain's final text, Top Shot, from Other Fountain, which will be very handy later. For now, though, he doesn't have any level 7 element slots, so we'll shoot our big yellow shot later. And maybe we'll find a doctor to help us take care of that because it definitely shouldn't be yellow. And finally, I grab Viper's Venom from a chest in Viper Manor, which is funny because I definitely renamed him Werner. This weapon is a big upgrade for him. Unless I suddenly become a non-lazy couch potato as opposed to the lazy couch potato I already am, this will be his final weapon. And now on to the dragons. The first dragon I tackle is the yellow dragon. With my characters resisting all yellow elements and attacks, this one was a no-brainer to start with. The yellow dragon almost exclusively uses physical attacks, so gate physical along with the natural resistance makes this battle a bit of a yellow cakewalk. His catastrophe attack only does about 120 damage to each character and there's not much else he can do so he goes down real quick. Next I tackle blue dragon and this guy has some powerful magic to both modify the field element and do big damage. He's able to get my characters down to critical HP but he ultimately goes down pretty quickly as well giving me the blue relic. And before I decide where to go next I complete the marbule side quest. This side quest is technically optional and completing it forces me to fight the 
the black dragon for its relic. If I skipped it, I could simply collect the relic by stealing it from his perpetually sleeping body. But if I don't fight him, I also miss out on a star level and the opportunity to craft spectral equipment. That's the strongest equipment in the game. And since I've just woken him up, I decide to fight the black dragon. And while it's not a complete shutout, I lose a character pretty quickly and decide to come back later. My party is clearly not ready yet. The next best choice then seems to be the green dragon on Gaia's navel. Its green attacks will be weakened by my yellow character's elements, meaning even though they'll take extra damage from them, if I can control the field effect, it shouldn't be too bad. Now, just my personal opinion, this section is pretty annoying. You have to kill every single monster in Gaia's navel before the green dragon will fight you, and there are a lot of them. So after we defeat Dr. Robotnik's mean green bean machine, there's a little pre-show before the main event. Tyranno wants to play. Tyranno? Tyranno? I don't know. He and his baby dragon friend are cute, but his physical attacks do surprisingly little damage, even to Lynx, who still has starting armor on. So he goes down pretty quickly to a combination of physical attacks and yellow elements. And now we're on to the Jolly Green Dragon, or the JGD. Unless the field is green, the JGD will almost always cast Green Field, which will change the entire field to green. And since this will weaken my attacks, strengthen hers, and allow her to cast powerful elements, I try to cast some sort of yellow element very quickly every single time it casts Green Field. There is one complication, though. She'll occasionally use the Bad Breath tech. And if you've played Final Fantasy, you know exactly what this does already. It inflicts a slurry of stupefying status effects. Darkness, fatigue, sprain, flu, it can do it all. And even worse, it can also cause the Dizzy status, which is the equivalent of silence in this game. This status hits Werner, and unfortunately, Fountain can't keep up with her elemental needs alone, so the JGD gets off a nasty carnivore attack with a completely green field. But it only does about half of my character's health, and we end up back in the same green field and bad breath cycle a few attacks later, just with less HP. Soon after, I get the JGD down to critical HP, and on a last-ditch attempt to win this battle of attrition, it casts Heal All. But all that means to me is that it's time to burst him down. I go full offensive at this point, hitting as many physical attacks as possible and casting all of my level 5 and 6 elements. And that's enough to take him out and get us our third dragon relic with zero deaths. And with his death comes new life in the form of Leah, whom we name Water. Which is exactly what she should be drinking, because she's a child. Children should not be drinking soda. No one should be drinking soda, but it is delicious. My next stop off is at the volcano, where we need to fight the red dragon. And this is where things get sticky. The red dragon starts in inky dinky form, which gives me time to get my element levels up and cast negate physical in preparation for his super saiyan form. Upon transformation, he has a pretty strict script. He starts off with a fire breath, which immediately does about half of my character's health. Yeah, we're not in Kansas anymore. He attacks physically, uses fire breath again, and then uses inferno. And once I survive all of that, he strengthens himself and uses more physical attacks. That means I need to re-up my negate physical to prevent more damage. And finally, the piece de resistance, he uses brimstone, which ensures the burn on my characters and decreases their defenses, and then another fire breath. I do get him down to critical HP on this tempt, but rather than going on the offensive, I heal, which was a mistake, because he very quickly gets in another fire breath, taking out Werner. And that means that if I finish him off, I won't get the star level, so I run. And I tried this battle about 20 more times because I hate myself, and I love being in pain, and you love to watch me suffer. But eventually I decide that maybe the black dragon is the better target now. Definitely not an easy battle, but I think I should be able to handle it now that I have another star level. It has powerful physical attacks as well, so Fizz Negate is necessary, but its magic attacks are not quite as hard hitting as those of the Red Dragon. Its Gravity Bomb now only does about a third of my character's health, and it has a bunch of pretty weak magic attacks it scatters in between its stronger ones. I get it down to low health, and then I accidentally run away. Just kidding. No, I don't. It's close, but I managed to burst down its last sliver of health with a thunderstorm and a few spurts from my fountain, and it's time to head back to the Red Dragon. So I leave the battlefield, and I fight a few enemies to nab another mini level, and I end up with one of the best I've seen in a while. My next Red Dragon try, Werner gets taken out by some physical attacks, which means it's time to run again. And the third time, I get wiped out by a fire breath, which means it's time to cry and curl up into the fetal position. A few tries later, though, I figure out a new opener. Rather than open with Negate Fizz, I start by casting High Res, which will decrease the damage from fire breath. And only after the Red Dragon transforms do I cast Negate Physical on both characters. That means it should last through the first two physical attack cycles. I also make sure to cast Golem about halfway through the battle for a big bowling of damage. That way, by the time he casts Brimstone, he's at low health. Fire Breath takes me down to low health, and it's now or never. Oh, sorry, I actually misread my script. It's actually now. The time is now. Because the Fire Dragon goes down to Fountain's powerful physical attacks. Huzzah! Which means we have one more obstacle before we can get Mellow Yellow's body back.
Jack, the White Dragon, gatekeeper of White Twinks. The big struggle of this battle is that he opens with Magnify, a spell that increases the damage of all elements in battle. But even with that bonus, this boss's Holy Breath only does a little bit more than half my HP. And of course, because he has access to Holy Healing, he uses that instead of aggressively attacking. That means I have some time to recover and reboost element levels. And this dragon is not that smart, because when he gets down to critical HP, he just recasts Magnify even though it hasn't worn off, because it doesn't wear off. That gives me more time to heal and attack. He casts Holy Breath one more time, but I've prepared myself and Fountain has enough strength to take down the White Twink Dragon. Which means we can now grab the Dragon Tier and head back to Fort Dragonia, which is known in the El Nido Archipelago as the Waxing Salon. But unfortunately, there can only be one White Twink at a time in the El Nido Archipelago. And that means it's time to fight Dark Surge, which makes no sense because my character's name is Mellow Yellow. It's, it's not Surge. Anyway, this fight represents the biggest difficulty spike of the entire game. Dark Surge always opens with a set of physical attacks followed by his Feral Cats attack that will invariably leave one of my characters with a quarter of their HP. And once Feral Cats goes up, Dark Surge transitions into a deadly volcano spell, taking out Werner and dashing any hope I have that this fight might be possible. Not that I didn't try. In fact, I tried this fight about 15 to 20 times. But every time, the elements just come way too fast for my characters to counter. If Yellow had better healing elements, it might be possible. Now, on one occasion, Dark Surge attacked Lynx first, which was the best possible scenario. However, Feral Cats still wrecked the team, and he came in with a Volcano Element and then soon after the Pièce de Résistance, Forever Zero. This tech, which is Lynx's level 7 tech, does about three quarters of my character's max health. And the one time I survived this tech, he follows it up by smothering me with his black hole. I gotta be black. <laughs> so this fight is essentially impossible with only yellow elements. That means it's time to use the second non-yellow element of the run, Diminish. You can buy this element in Guldove and it halves damage for the entire battle. However, the one kind of element it doesn't impact are consumable elements. That means my capsules will still heal the same amount. So on my next try, I use Diminish right away and the difference is immediately apparent. Dark Twink's Feral Cats only does 100 damage to each character and Volcano does a little bit less. Forever Zero does much less as well and even Tornado, which my characters are weak against, does a little bit less than a quarter of their HP. I also now have Fountain's level 7 tech equipped and that does a ton of damage. In any case, spoilers, I win on the first try. Because about half of the attacks Dark Twink uses are elements, I've more than half the damage he does, meaning it's much easier to heal, so I take him out. And now that we've defeated the Primordial Twink, he hands over the recipe. One overgrown pussycat and the Tears of the Dragon it rejected on Grinder. Stir them together and voila, Justin Bieber. And now that we've shaven our entire body, it's time to bound gracefully into the future like a beautiful gazelle. And by the future, I mean Chronopolis. But before that, we need to get the most crucial element in the game, Werner's level 7 tech, Flag Bearer. In a yellow only run, this is the most powerful element in the entire game, because first it increases every single one of Werner's stats, but second and even more importantly, it heals his HP to full. And while this won't completely eliminate my reliance on capsules, it is this tech that makes the rest of the game possible. So we head on to the entrance to Chronopolis and fight Vita. And while this battle isn't hard, I get cocky and get taken out by a volcano. So I guess the strategy has hasn't really changed, just use my element levels to heal and nothing else. And I'd say more, but that strategy just works and it's not an interesting battle and I don't like this bitch, so I have Fountain blast them with his yellow water gun. But the next battle does present a challenge. Polis Police has some powerful white techs and his Megaton Fist almost immediately hits Werner for three quarters of his health. And before I can heal, a second Megaton Fist takes him out and I run and restart. The battle starts the same way with Werner taking a punch to the face and I have him use his new healing tech, bringing him back to the full health he deserves and I accidentally run. God damn it. On try number three, I get negate physical onto both Menzes' right away. Fountain initially gets punched, but on the second time around, Werner takes the blow and his flag bearer heals him to full. Fountain top shots for massive damage and Polis Police next uses Bazooka on Mellow Yellow. That essentially gives me a free turn to do whatever I want. And whatever I want is destroying him with a thunderstorm, which gets me star number 39. And before before we get to number 40, we have one more side objective to fulfill. I skipped the Grand Slam earlier because there was no way to get more yellow monsters for Ice-T to transform into, but the time has come to change that. In the bottom of the stairs in Chronopolis, I grab the Forget-Me-Not pot. If a character wearing this in an accessory slot kills an enemy, Ice-T can then transform into that monster in battle. But she also gets access to that monster in the Grand Slam. So I head to Earth Dragon Isle where I grab Frolicker, Spinny Turtle, and Piss Frog, and I also grab a Cybot and a Gurgoyle from Fort Dragonia. And with those monsters,
monsters in tow, I am ready. You stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. In round one, I used Beba Gurgoyle and a dummy Komodo pup, which is enough to easily destroy Beeb clone Bull and Blob, and beating round one gets me the stamina belt, which is the entire reason I came here. And while it's really just a flex, a Cybot and Piss Frog are enough to take out round two. That gets me a resistant belt, which I really won't be using. And then Spinny Turtle and Frolicker take out the round three enemies with similar ease. That gets me a Dreamer belt and the character Janiche, whom I name Big Red. And with the stamina belt on Werner, he now recovers 1.1 stamina instead of the 1.0 he'd recover with a stamina ring, or the 0.9 he'd recover without either item. And that may be a small difference, but with only two characters, every little bit helps. So I head back through Chronopolis, and luck is on my side. As I battle, enemies keep dropping power seals, one of the best accessories in the game. These give a flat 5 attack to anyone, and once I get 5 of them, I load up Fountain and get ready for him to hit hard. And he's gonna have to, because there's one more boss battle in Chronopolis, Fate. Fate cycles through a set script, casting increasingly powerful elements, until it pops off. Fortunately though, it always starts the battle with Diminish, doing my job for me. The first time I fight it, however, the big problem is its final two attacks in the countdown. It casts Gravity Blow twice, which doesn't do too much damage, but sets up a mostly black field to increase its damage. And then it hits hard with Dark Energy, which hits for about two-thirds of my character's max HP. But as it cycles through for the second time, my characters get worn down and Fountain dies to an Energy Ray. So I run and I start again. So on Tri Bajillion and 1, it attacks Mellow Yellow with its initial Heat Ray. Then Freefall hits Werner at max health, and I can set up a high res on Fountain, which allows him to take less damage from Dark Energy. And with Werner at critical health, it's the perfect time for him to use Flag Bearer to recover fully and gain his stat boosts. From there, I need to be aggressive, keep my characters healed up, and try to kill Fate before the final Energy Ray. I get her down to critical health with physical attacks, and I hit her with a top shot, hoping I can finish her off. However, that does not happen, and Fountain gets taken down by an energy ray, but Werner still has skin in the game due to his buffs. And I make a controversial decision here. Rather than run and reset the battle, I finish off Fate with Werner's Air Force tech. Yes, that means I don't get the star level on Fountain, but I think it's worth it to take the W here when I can get it. Fountain is still hugely powerful, and I hope and pray that his stat loss will not bite me in the butt later. But you know what will bite me in the butt? These dragons. But not before they eat each other alive and merge into a giant mega dragon, forming Terra Tower in the process. And to get there, we'll have to make our boat fly. And maybe if all boats were able to fly, I'd support you buying a boat. But they don't, so don't buy a boat. But unfortunately, the next boss that we need to fight to make our boat fly is the Royal Jelly, and it can only be damaged by red elements. Not physical attacks, not status effects, not any other color of elements, only red elements. Now, I could make the argument that I should equip the strongest red elements and try to use as few as possible, but that doesn't seem painful enough, right? So instead, I just call this one a wash. I buy a bajillion fireballs, an incredibly weak spell, and I allocate them all to Squirt and Moo Pop. That's right, we're going to use the weakest possible elements in this battle just to prove that it's possible. So we are at three battles where I've had to use non-yellow elements. The battle itself, even with the worst possible elements, is pitifully easy. With that, we get star number 41 and attach the engine from Starkey's ship to our boat. And while I maintain that you shouldn't buy a boat, if you have a boat and you need to get rid of one, the best way to do that is probably to turn it into an airship. And that brings us, finally, to Terra Tower. The first boss here is Terrator, which is pretty lucky. It primarily uses physical attacks, but does have a smattering of yellow elements to throw at us. But since we're yellow innate, negate physical deals with the physical attacks, and our natural yellow resistance helps us bring down this brute within a couple minutes. And while the battle was completely uninteresting from a difficulty standpoint, the spoils are quite nice. Because upon its death, we gain the yellow field element, meaning we can now change the entire field element to yellow with one attack. This has a ton of utility. Because it changes the field effect to yellow, we can now much more easily use the Thunder Snake summon spell, along with Gollum, which we got earlier. More on that later. The next battle is with Pyrotor. This Renanate boss primarily uses physical attacks, meaning, you guessed it, negate physical is the strat here. It basically completely disables him, making him the easiest boss so far in the run. So I finish him off with a top shot to the face, and we head on to Animotor. And this one's a little bit harder. As a green innate, he does a ton of damage, both magical and physical. He opens with a few weak elements to change the field color, and I counter by using the gate fizz on both Werner and Fountain. But then his next Omega Green hits Werner, which is perfect, because even though his HP is now at bargain basement levels, Flag Bearer can bring him right back up to full and change the field element. Unfortunately, though, before I can use it, Animometer attacks with a disgustingly powerful carnivore attack, destroying Werner and forcing me to retreat. And on my second try, after it uses its weak elements, 
I immediately use Fountain to cast Yellow Field and Werner to cast Thundersnake. It heals after that, signaling that we're already in the end game of this battle and a few more attacks take it out. And I think that's the quickest battle I've had so far in this run. On the way up to Terra Tower, I make sure to grab the Spectral Glove. And I'm not sure when I did this, but because no one in my party uses a glove, I dismantled the Spectral Glove and turned it into a Spectral Gun with a Smithy. That gives Fountain a ton more firepower and will be really nice in later battles. But now things get a bit harder, because our next challenge is Gravitor. He's black and eight, and he opens with an Omega Black and takes out Mellow Yellow. But then it hits with some strong physical attacks, and even worse, two Hellbounds, which immediately takes out Fountain. Yeah, Black has all the instant death skills. So I run, and I try again. My goal is simple. Hit hard and fast to decrease the number of turns this battle lasts and reduce the RNG of instant death attacks. So I go Yellow Field into Thunder Snake immediately, and Gravitor heals with a Nostrum, indicating that it's already almost dead. A massively powerful top shot is enough to take it out without allowing Gravitor to cast a single instant death spell. And then I head on to Olivia Luxator. It opens with Omega White, and after a few attacks, it immediately uses Holy Healing, once again indicating that it's already feeling the heat. Some more physical attacks and an Electro Bolt from Werner, enough to finish off this big brute, and we're almost through Terra Tower. And the penultimate challenge of it is Aquator. His trademark as a blue unit is the Begora spell, which again increases his stamina to maximum and allows him to attack an infinite number of times until the spell runs out. Negate physical handily takes care of that. I use my yellow field, but he unfortunately immediately uses an Omega Blue on Werner right after that, and that disables my summons. But that honestly just seems like an excuse to boost Werner with Flag Bearer. Aquator then uses Ice Blast, Freezing Fountain, and making my life a lot harder, and his subsequent deluge kills him and forces a redo. I get a good start and apply Negate physical, and Omega Blue goes straight for Fountain, which is not ideal. And then Aquator Aquator immediately casts Deluge and Iceberg in succession, killing Fountain. Super fail boat. Okay, attempt number three. This time Omega Blue hits Mellow Yellow, which means I actually have a chance this time. And after a few strong attacks, Aquator casts Cure All, which of course signals that I've made huge progress. So I Yellow Field and Thunder Snake immediately, and a moderate attack and top shot from Fountain finish it off. So now that the big six are done, we're on to the fight that made me want to quit YouTube. We're fighting the Time Devourer, part one. And if you've made it this far in the video, do me a huge favor and hit the subscribe button. And if you're loving this video so far, join my Discord. My Discord is a community for people who love to watch me suffer and want to get behind the scenes tidbits about my videos. Oh, and also we post a lot of pictures of cats there. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate each and every one of you. Anyway, let me explain how the Time Devourer fight works. This dude bro starts off in the white element and cycles through all of the other elements as you deal damage to him in the order yellow, red, green, blue, black, and white. And either physically attacks, casts three elements in a row, or casts a level six element. But if you damage it fast enough, you can skip the level six elements altogether. And that is exactly what I intend to do. However, the yellow form is the exception to that, because with my Thunderstorm trap, I can both get a Thunderstorm element for the final battle, and more importantly, gain an extra turn to build up my element levels. So it's best to just wait for it, trap it, and keep the element. My first try of this boss, I obliviously cast Thundersnake on the yellow form, healing it, which means I need to run and retry. But the second try, I I get through yellow and red without seeing a single level six element. I cast Thundersnake on the green form and then it whacks Werner with an Omega green. And soon after we head on to blue. Werner heals with flag bearer and then we get into the black phase. But this is where things really get dicey. As the fifth phase, black has access to level five elements, holy light in particular, which causes the fatigue status on Werner, meaning it becomes even harder to heal efficiently. And that means that the transition to the boss's white form goes terribly. Ultra Nova wipes out Fountain and Werner's remaining health, putting me back at square one. Now, I tried a bunch of different tactics in the next 15 or so runs, and instead of just taking you through all of them, let me tell you why things went wrong. The first problem is that every time Time Devourer changes form, the field effect gets reset based on the terrain it chooses. This means that even if I end phase the red phase with a field full of yellow, we'll head into the green phase with two green field effect circles. That means specifically Tornado can do a ton of damage, and we'll have a chance to severely weaken both characters. And speaking of the level six elements, the black form can use the black hole spell, which as I mentioned before, not only does tremendous black elemental damage, but also has a chance to cause instant death. In a casual run, I probably just play it slow and steady. In fact, it's worth it to do that so you can capture these spells because it's pretty easy to get them all. And trapping the spells prevents them from doing damage to you. But I only have access to yellow elements, so I also only have access to yellow traps. But that's not the only type of instant death available to this boss. In its second and fourth form, it can cast Hell's Soul and Hellbound respectively.
effectively, both of which have a chance to instantly kill my characters. And all of this on top of the fact that I still only have two healing spells in total. Capsules, which always heal just 80 damage, and Flag Bearer, which can only be used one time per battle, even though it's a full heal. But here's the strategy I ultimately settle on. I get him into the yellow phase as quickly as possible, and then I cast my Thunderstorm Trap. After that, I get him close to the next phase, but not quite into it, and I let him cast Thunderstorm so I can trap it. That also lets me start the red phase at maximum element level. I try to get through the red phase as fast as possible to avoid both the level 6 volcano and a hell soul death. And believe me, I died a lot to hell soul. And then the green phase starts and my strategy is to immediately use yellow field followed by both the golem and thunder snake summons. This brings him immediately into the blue phase, allowing me to skip getting hit by a massive tornado. Unfortunately though, since blue is phase 4, I have to once again use the power of prayer to avoid instant death from hell soul spells, but fortunately he takes enough damage from attacks to get thrown straight into the black phase. A little bit of prayer is again required here. The black form almost always casts holy light before its level 6 black hole, and unfortunately, as I mentioned, holy light inflicts the fatigue status, but if I'm at high enough health, I can just skip out on healing for a bit and go full offense, and this will take us back into the white phase. Fortunately, I managed to save Fountain's top shot, which does a ton of damage, and I focus all of my element levels on healing. Ultra Nova takes out no one, but both Fountain and Werner are near dead now. Fatigue does eventually wear off, and by focusing all of my energy on physically attacking, I'm finally able to take out the Time Devourer. This fight took about 3 hours and 20 tries, but I did it all only with yellow elements. And that gets us our final star and our final stat boost of the game. And now there's only one more battle. The battle against the real Time Devourer. My first time fighting him, he starts off using only green elements. And this is by design. Until you use an element against him, it will only use green elements. And as you might guess, that's not great for my team. However, I use my yellow field element to take over the damage, and then I hit with Thundersnake and Gollum. After a couple more devastating elements, I have Werner heal, but then Fountain gets taken out by an Omega Blue spell, and Werner is soon to follow. The second try goes better. Rather than wait for him to act, I immediately use a yellow element on the Time Devourer. This makes him cast blue elements instead of green, making it much easier to withstand his onslaught. He does eventually hit Mellow Yellow with Omega Green, but that's just fine with me. My usual yellow field into Thundersnake and Gollum combo does a ton of damage, but Werner then gets taken down by an Omega Red, meaning it's time to start over one more time. The third try gets off to a rocky start with a carnivore spell back to back with a deluge, but this time I try a different strategy. I use low res on the time devourer, cutting his physical defense. This will allow Fountain's physical attacks, three of which do more damage than a golem spell, to do much more damage. Unfortunately though, Werner goes down to an omega green soon after, and we're on to attempt number four, and I use the same strategy again. I focus all of my energy on keeping the field effect yellow and healing in case of a surprise omega green. I also keep Fountain as healthy as possible while letting Werner get damaged a bit. That way, I can use his Flag Bearer tech to heal him and power him up. And I get a stroke of luck here. The Time Devourer attacks Mellow Yellow, meaning I'm around full health and have turns to spare. And for some reason, luck is on my side and it casts Omega Yellow, which does really not much at all. But given these extra moments, now is the time to cast Thunder Snake and Gollum. Werner gets Omega Blued, Fountain gets Omega Blued, and I spend every last element of I can healing up to survive the next attack, which is a deluge. Fountain's top shot adds to the Time Devourer's pain, and one more medium attack from Werner is enough to take down the Time Devourer. So I have beaten Chrono Cross with only yellow characters when available, and I only used yellow elements in three battles. Sprigs transform against Radius, diminish against Dark Surge, and fireballs against the Royal Jelly. And click this playlist to watch more of my RPG challenge runs, or magic hammers will permanently reduce your MP to zero. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.